the tombstone race, and flight and other stories. He worked as an English-Spanish court and conference interpreter in New York before earning, no, I'm sorry, in New Mexico. <laughs> I'm sorry, blind that. <laughs> before earning his MFA in fiction at the Iowa work, Writers' Workshop. His fiction and translations have appeared in Quarterly West, Colorado Review, Bilingual Review, and other literary journals. Jose. Thanks, Joe, and thanks to uh, everybody uh, that you know, helped set this up and for, for coming up. Um, I'm going to read, it's not as, the font's big, it's not as long as it It'll probably be about 20 minutes. Um, and this is a novel in progress, and uh, it's novel like so. And, uh, and uh, just to give you a little background, this is, um, has to do with this somewhat feckless um, assistant professor, his name by William Quigley, who teaches at the, the Department of Languages and Literatures at the University on the Border. And uh, just decided on the Texas side. <laughs> and he's gone to pick up a job candidate at the airport and take her to lunch. And they've ended up in a restaurant across the border in, in, in La Reina, Tabalipas, because even though the university has, he thinks, he said, remember, has a ban on all non essential travel to, to, that, uh, to, to Tabalipas, she's kind of cajoled him into taking, taking her there. And he wants to downplay the dangers, you know, and, you know not make her scared of living down there. And, you know, they fit it off pretty well. So anyway, he wants to impress her and all. So they get to this restaurant, and the chapter just down the middle of the chapter. Um, let me get one. The dignified, a dignified old waiter with an active draft over, draped over his forearm approached. ¿Qué le sentimos a beber? She ordered a margarita. Now what was he now what was he supposed to do? He wondered. Tell her it wasn't good for for a job candidate to order an alcoholic beverage, especially at lunch, and before her interview with the hiring committee. <laughs> Warn her that they made the drinks super strong here because they learned that the green was coming to Mexico express you to get smashed. Or join her. Okay, meet her halfway. He ordered a beer. They had two hours before they were expected on campus. I've never walked into Mexico, she said. Only driven. That felt weird. Weird? Like you just strolled into this whole other country and nobody knows. <laughs> now you see why now you see why after people he says, now, now you see why uh, why after people commit a crime they immediately think of disappearing into Mexico. And some of them do, right? Oh sure, but it's not that easy. There's always Interpol and all that sort of thing. Interpol. Those guys go only after major criminals, don't they? I guess so, maybe. Actually, he knew nothing about Interpol. <laughs> but whenever an American fugitive was caught in Mexico, Mexican authorities handed him over to the Americans on the bridge. Quigley always assumed the Mexicans must have had some kind of help. Interpol, maybe? Because when did they ever catch anybody on their own? <laughs> Impunity was the word in this country. He had recently seen a headline on a Mexican paper in, in, Pro, in, the, in a Providencia, that's a town where he lives, uh, in a Providencia convenience store. Impunidad de Juniors, and had gathered that the article described how the children of the privileged juniors were immune from punishment for their crimes. He would mentioned this to some of his students, and they had concurred with his interpretation as well, with, as well as with the sentiment of the article, agreeing that the privileged in Mexico were indeed so immune because they enjoyed prepotencia, the arrogance of power. Evidently, captured American fugitives didn't have such power. That is to say, enough money to pay off the Mexican authorities. But now he'd gone and done it, brought up the, brought up the subject of crime himself. There was a compulsion to do so whenever Mexico was mentioned these days. Some people like the grilled carrito kidney, he said, returning to the menu. He himself was repulsed by its urinous tang, <laughs> but, but organ meats were always a good subject changer. Everybody liked to talk about tongue and tribe in the time they accidentally ordered sweet meats at an exotic restaurant. <laughs> she placed the menu at the table's edge. I'm going to be boring to go with ch chicken enchiladas. Good choice. She took another sip of a drink and said, 
you could really have disappeared out here if nobody was looking for you. If nobody's looking for me for you, why would you need to disappear? <laughs> she laughed her trilling laugh again, right the finger at him, took another sip. She was down to the ice. And if she ordered another, would he make it his business to intervene? Did you ever see that movie, A Winter Tan? Uh, oh, oh, never mind. Maybe it was he who shouldn't be drinking beer this early. What was it about, she said. Well, just as a complete professor who disappeared into Mexico, a student of Paul Demand's, incidentally. It wasn't a really movie. What happened to her? She disappeared. Why'd she go? Ms. Mondragon seemed to be having fun not letting it lie, so he might as well bludgeon it out bluntly. She was a second wave feminist who decided to commit her life to sexual adventure and fucking as many Latino lovers as possible. <laughs> well, I see. An awkward silence followed before she said, well, excuse me as I also disappear for a minute. And after balancing herself with a cup of three fingers bent to the table, she headed toward the ladies' room. Okay, that's the beginning of the, of the previous chapter. And, this, and I'll read you the, 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 the chapter three. Uh, Quigley watched mushroom clouds of smoke rise from the griddles, seriously regretting having brought up a winter tan, not to mention describing it so crudely. Regretting this, regretting this whole jaunt to Mexico, really. When it became clear that no other faculty were going to join them for lunch, why had he just taken her to the student union for a taco and then fobbed her off on a grad student who would give her a campus tour until the time for the interview? This was all way beyond the call of duty. He wasn't the hiring committee chair. Thank you. was the most junior of all its members. He ordered enchilada, the enchilada squeeze as she'd asked him to, and the cabrito stew for himself and waited for Dr. Mondragon to return. Ms. Mondragon, she was ABD, he reminded himself, all but dissertation, and until she finished the, that document, she was not yet a doctor of philosophy. Now it occurred to him that it would probably be a good idea for someone in the search committee to call her dissertation chair to confirm that she would have this dissertation finished by, and her PhD in hand by Bravo's hiring date, as the regs specify, specified. Any doubt about her ability to do so wouldn't bode well for her candidacy if someone really wished to press it. He eyed the melting rocks in her glass, recalled her unsteadiness as she'd gotten up. Was it possible she didn't need this job, having already gotten an offer from another school, but had decided to take advantage of the free trip and drinks? This sort of thing was rumored to happen, though he'd always suspected it was a story concocted by guilty-minded hiring committees who sometimes did more or less the opposite, invited applicants for campus visits while already knowing they were going to hire an inside candidate. Or having gotten a glimpse of the area, maybe she'd already decided that she didn't want the gig and that she might as well kick back. His gaze penetrated the smoke and came to rest on the Art Deco facade of the Capri Hotel across the plaza, and a vision of a drunken afternoon with her ending up at that hotel flashed through his mind. Career ruined. His career. <laughs> Insane. A younger waiter trundled the cart to their, cart to their table and started preparing the guacamole, cleaving the avocados in two with one rounded motion of his knife, flicking the seeds out and scooping the flesh with an equally smooth movement, then chopping the onions and cilantro into the gray-green and into the yellow-green mound. He wished he were there to admire the dexterity of it all, but she was taking her time. Well, it had been a long flight. He must try not to think about what she might be doing in the ladies' room, which was where she had to have disappeared to. Surely she hadn't gone outside to smoke. As far as he could tell, there were no restrictions on smoking in Mexico, and people were lighting up all over the restaurant. By the time the old waiter arrived with the food, he was frankly worried. He didn't have the Spanish to fluently ask the waiter to send a woman into the women's room to see if she was okay, but he, but he tried. The waiter agreed, Cece, but as quickly watched his goat stew get cold and the old waiter attend other tables, he realized the man must have been misunderstood and blown him off. He strode down the, the blue tiled hall to the restrooms. They were at the very end, he remembered from the other time he had been to Las Casas, and knocked on the, dam the door of the damas and called her name. No response. Called again louder. Nothing. He looked around, saw nobody, so he cracked the women's room door open and called inside. Dr. Mondragon, Ms. Mondragon, Minerva. Silence. He couldn't phone her, assuming she had a cell on her, 
and he could get reception down here because he left his phone with her number in his car because he didn't get reception in Mexico. There was something hellish looking about the restaurant now. It's dark, heavy furniture, the live embers in the barbecue pit, the smoke, the ghoulish old waiter to whom he had no other choice but to speak again. La señorita, donde? A couple of other waiters heard him. Amused scorn crossed their faces. It was plain to them that the young woman had walked out on him, and that the best thing for him to do was to quietly acknowledge the fact and proceed along with his lunches with as much dignity as he could muster. Or what the hell, when he make a scene and embarrass himself further, the customer's always right. Their faces returned to serious. The old waiter touched the dark bag under his eye and tilted his head to the front door to a signal for them to go out and cast a look around the street. He turned back to Quigley and held his thumb and forefinger forefinger an inch apart. Quigley took his seat and watched the waiter go into the kitchen and return with a short dark woman who undid her apron as she proceeded down the blue tiled hall. Quigley got up and followed them. The woman came out of Navas and shook her head. No hay nadie. Pero donde? Donde? Quigley knuckled his head. A thin man in a suit came out of the men's room and Quigley accosted him. Senorita, chiquita, usted there? The man regarded him with shiny, skeptical eyes and rushed by. Otro gringo borracho. <laughs> the old waiter's eyes cut to an unmarked door. Quickly pushed it open. A delivery area opened into an alley and the street. You're saying she came out here, he said in English. Is that what you're saying? He started out to the street. He just walked away, disappeared like she said she was going to do. That's crazy. That's fucking crazy. La cuenta, called the waiter. <laughs> Quickly stabbed the un minuto sign at the waiter and went on. The hot fetid alley was empty, the side street nearly so. Just one taxi, whose driver held his hands out in a where to gesture. But you couldn't trust these taxistas. His students, all, his students said they were all falcons, spies for the narcos, so better not to engage him and ask him if he'd seen her. Quickly circled around to the plaza, which was also nearly abandoned. He asked a pair of shoeshine boys sitting on the de in the dense shade of an ebony if, she, if they'd seen an Americana, Chicana, and they stared at him and shook their heads. The old, waiter, the old waiter had followed him and now stood in front of the restaurant, arms crossed. Next to him, a solid-looking man with a goatee and a shaved head. The solid man approached quickly. The check, sir, he said in English, smiling the silver-edged smile. The check, the bloody check. Well, how much do I owe? I'm looking for someone. A woman, this, this tall, slender, dark hair, dressed in black. I can't have lost her. She's the candidate. The candidate? Yes, the candidate, the candidate. She's been kidnapped or something. She's gone. The solid man's brow wrinkled. I shouldn't make too much scandal, sir. You shouldn't? I should. The police. The police need to look for her. Police? Uh, no, 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 no. The police will be a mistake. Why? Because she's disappeared from your restaurant? They'll take you to the delegation for questions. They'll arrest you. Arrest me? But something told him the man might be right. Quickly he got the idea from his students that the Mexican police were to be avoided at all costs. Sir, you should come back inside. And do what? She's not there. You've already looked for her. A police car nosed its way to the plaza by the side of the Las Plazas. The man's eyes darted from Quigley to the patrol car and back to Quigley. We'll look for her. You must go home. Where'd you, where'd you park? On the U.S. side of the bridge, we walked across. Now you're saying you should just leave? The patrol car purred up next to them and stopped. The solid man made a, made a click of disappointment with his tongue. The cop at the wheel stared at him with oily porcine malevolence. The old waiter slipped back into the Las Brasas. Quickly had taught a section of sophomore literature the year before, a special topics course of his own devising, English writing in Mexico. It had covered works by Graham Greene, Catherine Ann Porter, D. H. Lawrence, Malcolm Laurie, and other English and American writers of novels and stories set in Mexico. Lowry, a terrible alcoholic, had gotten into his share of trouble in the country and been kicked out. He held a grudge against it. Once when contemplating the Mexican coast from a ship, he wrote a rant to his wife 
about what an evil hellhole my school was. Quigley read the letter to his students, and none of them had even cracked a smile. Most of them had relatives on the Mexican side whom they visited frequently, though less frequently since the narco wars had begun. And some of them were born there or had lived there for extended periods. But it was difficult to get them to generalize about the country. They certainly didn't see it as magical the way some of those writers, Lawrence especially, did. Their familiarity with it had perhaps disenchanted them. And though they might readily agree that the police couldn't be trusted, that corruption was rampant, that the poverty was depressing, he couldn't see them ever calling it evil either. But quickly, in that semi-deserted plaza, hammered by the sun, its newspaper stand blaring bloody headlines about the violence, six decapitated bodies in Monterrey. The, oil, the oily policeman watching him with his piggish eyes while this other man warned him to leave the country in the wake of the disappearance of an innocent young woman he had made the mistake of taking there, quickly felt the evil. The solidly built man beckoned to a taxi, but veered away from them. He whistled, and a second, an apparently braver one, pulled up. The cop watched. The man opened the door for Quigley and told the driver, I went it. <laughs> Quigley turned to scrutinize every woman they passed, even those two heavy set and colorfully dressed to be nervous, as though he could no longer fully trust his eyes. He wouldn't have trusted the solid man's urgency either, if not for the fact that the man had hustled him off without asking him again to pay for the check. Go home, the man had urged him as soon as the police appeared and repeated, we'll look for him. But it was cowardly to leave. He should tell the taxi driver to turn around. He should keep looking for her. Hell, he should tell him to drive straight back to the plaza and he should tell the cops, look assholes, there's a woman missing, una americana, and I don't care who you really work for or what your deal is, I want you to find her. But he didn't know how to say all that in Spanish, and even in English the words sounded laughable. He imagined the cop saying, get in, meaning the patrol car. The last thing he wanted to do, according to his students, was get in a Mexican cop car, much less go down to the station with him, which is exactly what they'd ask him to do. And then he'd be like one of those gringos you occasionally read about in the papers, locked up for weeks and even months in a Mexican jail without a hearing, and what good would you, what good, um, and, and then what good would he be in finding her? The taxi drove up to the bridge turnstiles. The driver, still looking stolidly ahead, asked for six dollars. Quigley gave him five and four quarters, and the driver turned and gave him one of the quarters and pointed to the turnstiles. The day a cabbie gives you a fair money, fair money back, uh, back to make sure you get to where you're going, that's a guy who wants you to get there. Quigley could see on the other side of the bridge the American flag billowing in the breeze and thought, there, over there is where I can get help. Quigley trotted over the bridge and in his haste to get to the CBP agent on, in the customs house, stepped over the yellow wait, wait here at his periaki sign before the agent was finished interrogating the woman in front of him. Step back, sir, the agent barked. Quigley retreated two steps, bumping into the man behind him. Now come forward. The person I was with, she got lost. She, citizenship, hers? A American, US, she was with me. And then, no, sir, yours. American, U.S., passport, I didn't bring it. The woman regarded him heavy lidded the line behind, behind him lengthened. Sir, how do you expect to cross international borders without a passport? He couldn't stand being talked down to. He prided himself in never talking down to his students like some professors did, the ones who had been at it too long, the unhappy white ones like this woman. Where do you work, sir? Okay, that's good. I'm a professor at Bravo University, assistant professor. I was with another professor in Arena, a student actually, a graduate student. I lost track of her. I think she's still down there. I mean, I know she is, unless for some, a, a professor and a student down in Arena. So, she's not my student. She's from another school interviewing for, for a professorship with us. You were having the interview in Mexico? The lunch before the interview. What does it matter? There's a woman missing. She looked him up and down, and he realized how ridiculous his tierra caliente outfit, the vanilla ice cream linen pants, Panama hat, and sandals, must look to her. This wasn't Acapulco, this was South Texas ranch country. Here, even professors wore jeans and boots. 
another professor he was in. Failure to give the solid man his number or any way of contacting him and use of Minerva now seemed to be part of, now seemed to him part of a fortuitous pattern of erasures of the trip to Mexico. It was as if that trip had happened at all, and if she showed again, he would deny that it had. Of course, there was the record of her having boarded the plane to Providencia, and security camera footage of the two of them meeting at the airport, but she'd already exited the terminal by then. Were cameras trained on that spot too? If he had the time, he could swing by and ascertain. No, no, idiot. No returning to the scene of the crime. But what crime? Why was, he even, why was he even thinking like this? Why, the crime he was going to commit when he walked into the meeting and announced that, she, and announced that she hadn't shown, that he hadn't met her, hadn't even seen her. <laughs>